to Luke chapter number nine. Amen. And we're going to uh, see what the word of God, how it speaks to us today. In the name of the Lord, amen. And certainly want to send a great shout out to the Cal basketball team on the men's side for sweeping this past weekend. That's some great developments. Amen. Congratulations on that. Amen. All y'all go Bears people and, and uh, all y'all haters. It's all right too. Amen. Yes, yes, yes. All right. Uh, Luke chapter number nine, we certainly want uh, to spend a few moments here in this passage. When you got to say, I got it, or you can turn it to the screen and it should be up here on the screen as well. The scripture reads uh, in this way, about eight days after saying this, and uh, maybe it helps to appreciate what Jesus was saying, amen. Uh, if you read the verses previous to this particular verse, you find that Jesus had taken his disciples with him throughout the ministry of his uh, work and, and took them to a place in uh, the Holy Land called Caesarea Philippi. It is one of the uh, regions of the Roman Empire at the time. This region was not one that was very friendly or familiar to the Jewish uh, Israeli culture folks of that day. And there in the middle of this very foreign environment, uh, Jesus began to quiz his disciples and he asked them, who do people say I am? And many of the disciples attempting to try and capture the rumors and the descriptions being bantered around town of who Jesus was. He said, some say that you are Moses, some say that you are Elias or Elijah, prophets and messengers that have come reincarnated to this current, current moment. And Jesus asked them, but who do you say that I am? Talking to his disciples who had spent a little time with them. And Jesus found Peter uh, speaking up saying, Thou art the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus tells Peter, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but our Father which is in heaven. And it just speaks to uh, a very powerful truth that there are very differing opinions about not just the God of your salvation, but even about you. And that one of our great challenges as followers of Jesus, I believe, is to reckon with all the cacophony of voices we have out here that are kind of you know, given some variated opinions and descriptions of who God is and who we are. And yet there is a revelation that can come from God that can clear all of it up relatively quickly. And so it is in this environment, a foreign place, a very unfamiliar place, that Jesus begins to ask his disciples about who they say he is. And it is in this foreign space that God gives his disciples this revelation. I hope you realize that you don't always have to be in a familiar place to learn something new about God. Man, the God will often give you your greatest revelation when you are in one of your most unfamiliar places on your journey. You ever got a good revelation from God when you was kind of out in a foreign land and you're like, wow, God, uh, a light bulb came on out here and I wasn't even expecting it. If you like me, I'm praying for these light bulbs to come on continuously. So after Jesus, uh, eight days after he said all of that, Jesus took with him uh, Peter and John. The scripture I read out of the message translation says, Jesus climbed the mountain to pray. And taking Peter, John, and James along, while he was in prayer, the appearance of Jesus' face changed and his clothes changed became blinding white. At once two men were there talking with him and they turned out to be Moses and Elijah. And what a glorious appearance they made. They talked over his exodus, the one Jesus was about to complete in Jerusalem. Let's keep reading. Meanwhile, Peter and those with him were slumped over in sleep. When they came 
two, rubbing their eyes, they saw Jesus in his glory and the two men standing with him. When Moses and Elijah had left, Peter said to Jesus, Master, this is a great moment. Let's build three memorials, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He blurted this out without thinking. And while he was babbling on like this, a light radiant cloud appeared and enveloped them. And as they found themselves buried in the cloud, wouldn't that be something? Man, you with Jesus, you just seeing all these spectacular things, and all of a sudden you get lost in the cloud with Jesus. Amen. How many know there's some worse places to be? Amen. They're being enveloped in a cloud with Jesus. Amen. Uh, I'm too deep today for y'all. Somebody say amen. As they found themselves buried in the cloud, they became deeply aware of God. Then there was a voice out of the cloud, this is my son, the chosen, listen to him. And when the sound of the voice died away, they saw Jesus there alone and they were speechless. They continued to be speechless, saying not one thing to anyone during those days of what they had seen. It's the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us all say thanks be unto God. All right, we're going to use as a title for our sermon today, Don't Miss What God is Trying to Show You. Amen. Don't miss what God is trying to show you. Come on, let's pray together. God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. Thank you that this word is a light unto our feet, a lamp unto our path. I pray, God, that you will... Bless us, Lord God, as we attempt to preach and teach and hear and understand your word. Lord God, may it be like fire. May it show us, God, what you are attempting to teach us today. And this is our prayer in the name of Jesus the Christ, we pray. Let the people of God say amen. Amen. Pat yourself on the chest and say, I can't miss what God wants to show me. What God... Now... This is the last Sunday in the liturgical calendar of the church for this season uh, that we call Epiphany Sunday. Epiphany Sunday across the global church is a particularly important season of reflection and revelation about God and how God chooses to reveal God's self to God's people. Epiphanies, particularly in the biblical text, are important uh, kind of spectacular out of the ordinary expressions of who God is and how God's revelation is attempting to push you and I beyond our particular place of understanding, dare I say even our comfort zone. Part of the great challenge of the American church continues to be how we allow our faith to be a rubber stamp for all of our worst impulses, rather than us allowing this faith to radically transform us into a, as the other New Testament writers say, transforming us into the image and the likeness of God. You know, it is always, I think, for many of us, a great wrestling match we have with faith because uh, if we were to tell the truth, there are things that happen in the world that put you and I's faith in great tension. Amen. Uh, some of us, you know, just opt out altogether and be like, you know what, I'm just going to let this lead this faith thing alone. And I'm just going to try to go my own way and, 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 and try to lean into fate or some other kind of schema of, of arrangements of my events or of the events that are happening. But I want to declare to we who are followers of the ways of Jesus that we ought to never allow what is happening in our everyday lives or even in our larger 
experiences to cause us to lose the ability to trust that God is active and always at work revealing God's self to us in ways we have not yet caught on. That it is a great challenge to live in a society overrun with evil, both personal, systemic, structural, and even the evil beyond us. And hold that in the great tension of this way we know about God or we've been taught to believe about God, and yet we find things irreconcilable. Anybody ever been in an irreconcilable state with your faith? Amen. Where, you know, you kind of, you know, thought some things were quite true, non-negotiable and settled, and then all of a sudden you kept on living and it put it all in tension with one another, anybody, or is that just me, amen? You can have some experiences that'll happen that you did not expect, nor could you explain, and those experiences created a kind of dissonance, uh, a dissonance that causes and makes you and I somewhat either surprised or numb about what God is up to. I want you to appreciate, dear loved one, that this is an opportunity for you and I, particularly now, as we are surrounded by all of the disappointments uh, of, of, our, of our current moment, uh, the, the challenges that we continue to realize or at least experience with injustice, particularly this, this yesterday I, I spent the day part of the day at least, in Sacramento with some of our loved ones uh, attempting to respond once again to the, the non-indictment of officers who, uh, who killed uh, our dear brother Stefan Clark in his grandmother's backyard and shot him in the back eight times. And for some reason, uh, there was not enough evidence, according to the district attorney, amen, to, to hold these folks accountable. I, I got a, a couple of email reports from some of our comrades in our immigrant movement spaces uh, letting us know that thousands of children are being abused, sexually abused in the presence and the, the responsibility of our health and human services people and, and, and all of these just evils that persist, that continue to just crop up uh, you know, as I read them, I, I, was, I was stricken with a level of grief and disillusionment because I was saying to myself, Lord, what would possess people who claim to follow you to be so complicit in these kinds of evils? And, you know, I, 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 I know we spend a good chunk of time highlighting some of these challenges, and it's not lost on me that many of us have our own challenges. Amen. And we don't need a headline. Amen. To scroll across your TV, uh, realizing that there are some difficulties that show up in our lives unannounced. And we are constantly attempting to reckon and to wrestle with God. What are you attempting to show me in this very difficult season? Could it be that one of the great gifts of a season like Epiphany, or at least even what we find in this text, is that God is always at work attempting to show us something that we have not yet known or learned, regardless of the circumstance you find yourself in. That as Jesus took the disciples to Caesarea Philippi, a very foreign place so they could get some kind of a new revelation about who Jesus was. Perhaps God allows us in our foreign places to begin to tap into a truth about God and dare I say ourselves that you would not get if everything was going according to your plans and your schemes. Could it be that God can use some of our most difficult seasons and unlock a blessing, unlock a revelation, unlock something that can help you take the next step rather than you continuing to live out the status quo 
of your life. And I'm here to tell you, those revelations, though great they may be, may not always reconcile with what you know today. Anybody ever, you know, had some voices in your mind about what you thought was right, and then you get more information, and you're like, oh, you know, I can, I can, I, I, all right, that, 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 that's cool. You know, I, I grew up in a holiness tradition, you know, old school holiness. We used to joke that we were harder than God. <laughs> amen. Somebody say amen. It's like, you know, you know, you know, God is, God is, is hard, but you harder than God. Amen. You got, God, God, you get more mad than God get. Anybody been around folk like that? It's like, you know, you'd be like, man, I don't want to serve that God because that God seemed to be mad all the time. I remember we, 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 we was, we was uh, you know, couldn't do anything when I was growing up. We couldn't listen to secular music. My brother, I remember my first time TJ brought home uh, Bobby Brown, a little cassette tape of Bobby Brown. And my dad found it in his room. And my dad was like, somebody brought the devil up in my house. <laughs> Amen. And, you know, my brother was a musician back then, you know, and he used to throw these little licks in, you know, from the Gap Band and kind of what y'all was doing earlier today. Somebody say, man. And, and, and you know, uh, you know my, 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 my dad, I remember he did something with Sly and the Family Stones in the service. And my dad, just he just got all bent out of shape and took him out the spirit because there was a certain assumption with my father, at least, old school holiness, Deacon James McBride. Y'all think, I, I thank God for my dad. He's grown a bit, but y'all don't know my dad. I just want you to know that. Y'all be seeing my dad, he just be grinning and smiling all the time. Oh, God bless you, God bless you. But there was a time. I still have the voices in my mind. Amen. We, 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 they used to tell us that we couldn't go to the movies. Amen. So I remember the first time I snuck out to the movies. Uh, and, and watch Karate Kid Part 2. <laughs> Amen. And I remembered in my mind how my dad used to tell us, blessed are those who walk not in the council of, council of the ungodly, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. And the movies was the seat of the scornful. <laughs> mm. So I'm sitting there trying to enjoy the Karate Kid. I just knew I was on my way to hell. Amen. <laughs> Amen. But something about that Karate Kid, it just was, it, it, it was worth it. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Some of y'all laughing, but you know you, 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 you had some things, me and Minister Lauren was talking about this, how we, we, we got these voices in our mind that, that are stretching us. You know, we, 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 we're growing and we're, we're getting a different understanding of what it means to be faithful. But yet we got these voices in our mind that, that, that are still playing. The people, my dad ain't even around. I still hear his voice. Amen. And guess what? That version of my dad ain't even around, but I still hear his voice. Think of all of the voices still talking to you decades ago. Think of all the imprints. I remember when I was doing my psychology classes and we talked about how our brain creates imprints of trauma that can easily be triggered by smells and tastes and images. I remember when I came, maybe that's why I'm, I'm, my eyes won't stop tearing up. I, I remember I came back from Ferguson and I used to just be all, uh, you know, we, we was out there getting flashbang grenaded and, and tear gassed. And, 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 and I just remember how hard it was to come back home when I would hear loud noises and all of a sudden my body would tense up. I would break down in tears and I had to go through all this therapy just to reset my equilibrium. And being up there yesterday with some of the loved ones and just having to, again, sit in the pain of all this trauma. That's just my trauma. Think about all of the trauma we are forced to endure of betrayal and disappointment and how if we are not careful, we will allow those experiences to overdetermine the God who is seeking to always reveal God's self to us beyond our worst experiences. Could it be, child of God, that one of the great opportunities on this last Sunday of Epiphany, as we now move into a season of journey towards resurrection, 
that there is an opportunity for you and I to start asking God, what are you trying to show me given all the things that I've had to endure? What is it that you are trying to teach me given all the things I'm going through right now? Because I heard someone told me this week that I don't need to wait for a headline to be aware of tragedy. I have tragedy in my life every day. Every day I wake up, I'm aware of the difficulties that I must navigate. But even in that space, I hear God saying, I can show you something that can take you to the next step. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You are not meant to live in your worst pain. God says, I can give you some healing. I can give you some new information that will help you move to the next stage of your life. But you got to not miss what God is trying to show you. Give your neighbor a high five and tell him, don't you miss it today. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. First thing that I believe the scripture lifts up there for us, if we are not going to miss what God is trying to show us, we must be willing to go to higher ground. Somebody say, let's go to higher ground. Uh, verse, verse number, I believe it's verse number 18. The scripture says that Jesus climbed the mountain to pray, taking Peter, John, and James with him. It's important to appreciate a couple things. First, I appreciate that Jesus, on his way to the mountaintop, refused to go by himself. And that for many of us, we are used to a mountaintop experience being radically and individually about yourself. That in order for me to get to a higher ground, I just got to go by myself. But biblically and certainly according to our faith, you cannot get to the mountaintop alone. You can try. But how do you get to the highest place of revelation without some help, without some companions? I want to encourage you, child of God, do not go alone. Slow your roll. Wait for God to send you some trusted companions. Now be clear, as we saw in the text, Jesus had to move from Caesarea Philippi, a strange place, a place that was foreign to him, surrounded by a lot of folk who didn't know who Jesus was. Jesus had to move from that place to make a journey to climb up to a mountain. Could it be that God is trying to remove you from some places? Remove you from some certain crowds of people so you can get to the mountaintop because even though you can't go alone, you still can't take everybody with you. <laughs> I know for all us codependent folk up in here, that's hard. Amen. Because some of us want to save everybody, even if we lose ourselves. But I believe that mature Followers of Jesus and just mature, healthy people have boundaries that remind you that you can't save everybody. Dare I say you can't save yourself. I wish I could talk to somebody up here. And you, you can make some choices to get closer to the transcendent power of the living God who can help usher salvation in on your behalf. But sometimes you have to be sure that if you're going to higher ground, don't you drag along people, places, ideas that will keep you from making your ascent. I know, you know, I, I'm, I'm one of these folk where I don't be want to leave nobody behind. Anybody, any, any, anybody ever, you know, been trying to get to a place and you try to wait for folk and then you miss your ride, you miss the show, you miss it all? And then, you know, if you like me, I'm not saying that's how you are. But then you just, you, you, you upset. <laughs> Your good intentions turn into a lot of bad feelings. Hello, somebody. Oh, I'm just here to tell you, put some good boundaries in your life. You can love folk from a distance. 
while you get to higher ground. Because higher ground, rarefied air, not everybody's lungs is built for that. Amen. Mm -hmm. Some folk, they have adjusted to the valley. They've adjusted to some of these places that you can't be there any longer. So you, 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 ought to, you ought to make some decisions now. If Jesus, listen, is climbing up a mountain and is inviting you to come to higher ground and your boo and your comrades and your ace boon coons don't want to go, I wish I had a pink slip up in here, amen. You better give somebody, a, hey, listen. You got a choice. You can come along with me to higher ground. I'm elevating my thinking. Some of us have been formed after the ways of Jesus, and we have been locked into the valley, theological valleys, practices that repeat the valleys. And God is saying, no, 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 it's time for you to get to some higher ground. What would it like for you to get to some higher ground? Listen, Jesus took them to higher ground to pray, not to have a party. How many of you know that higher ground will always open up the most important parts of you, which is not your flesh. I'm not hating on the flesh and the body. But don't you know the constellation of the, of the human being, as, as we understand it in Scripture, it talks about the love the Lord God with your heart, mind, soul, body, all these different parts of you. We fixate on the body. Amen. We spend all kind of money to get our body right. Or not. <laughs> Amen. But what are you doing to get your soul right? How much therapy? You know, oh, you know the, the therapist session is $50. Do you have enough prioritization of your mental well-being that you're willing to spend $50, $60 to go get your mind right? Hello, somebody. Oh, it's too expensive. It ain't, I'm looking at what you're wearing. Somebody say amen. It ain't too expensive unless you just don't believe that your mind, your mental well-being is worth that kind of investment. Your soul, well, I'm too busy to be in a community of people pursuing God. So I'm just going, you know, mm, well, you know, fascinating. <laughs> How many know there's always a situation that will help you make time? You don't have no time till you got to make time. Higher ground. I'm talking about some higher ground now. God is trying to get some of us to higher ground, and we got a lot of excuses why we can't go there. And guess what? When you don't get to higher ground, you don't get to see as far as you could when you was in the valley. You stay in the valley, yo, yo, the mountains are the biggest things you see. When you're on the mountaintop, you see it all. Uh, nudge your neighbor, tell him, come on, let's go to higher ground. Let's go to higher ground. And, 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 and listen, when, when, when the scripture says they were on higher ground, what else happened? While they were praying. So again, make sure you got folk who are willing to go with you to higher ground and do some soul work. Spirit work. Everybody needs them kind of friends in their life. You got your party friends. You know, I got some party friends. Don't really call them that much, man, because I don't party. Maybe that's my Lent commitment is to party. No. <laughs> you got your activist friends. You got your gossiping friends. You got your messy friends. Your s who are your Friends who get your soul and spirit to higher ground. Some of y'all need to, need, to, need to get all your friends and put them on a piece of paper with columns. Be like, all right, when I want to have a good time, I know to call you. When I want to, you know, get, get to higher ground in my spirit, I know to call you. I know to call you when I need to be talked into going to therapy. I know I need to call you when I don't want to be alone and isolated and depressed. Structure your life so you can get to higher ground. Don't just allow life to happen to you. 
and you stay in the valley, Lord, I'm rambling. What are the questions? What steps are you taking to get to higher ground away from the crowds? And who are the people you need to leave behind and take with you? Mm -hmm. And what practices are you going to do to ensure that your higher ground experience actually helps you to see what God is doing in this season of your life. I believe, child of God, that God is doing something. Some of us just have to figure out, Lord, how do I get to a place where I can perceive it? Second thing the scripture says that I want to lift up for us today is in verse number 32. Peter and his companions, they were weighed down with sleep, but since they stayed awake, they saw the glory of Jesus. We said all the time, stay woke, right? But how many know that there is a way you can be so woke you go to sleep? And I believe that's kind of, you know, folk, we, woke is woke culture. We got a whole culture now called woke culture. And he's some of the most sleepwalking folk I've ever met. Amen. <laughs> How can you be so woke and be so angry? So full of animus. And I think sometimes we, we confuse the kind of wokeness that we got running amok in the world today and the kind of challenge of scripture for us to stay awake. They were being weighed down with sleep. How many of you know that there are some things in our lives that are actively attempting to put you to sleep? Because if you are asleep, if your senses are so dulled that you cannot see what God is up to, God can be active around you and you not even perceive it. These disciples got the invitation to come to the higher place with Jesus, and they said yes, and yet the devil, the enemy, did not stop trying to weigh them down with sleep. You can be in the right place, you can be taking the right steps, and yet there can be things still trying to cause you to miss what God is doing. Think of all these distractions happening in the world that are trying to weigh you and I down with sleep. Think of all the challenges, the traumas that are attempting to weigh you down to sleep. I want you to think about all the many ways that God is trying to awaken the part of you that the world is trying to keep asleep. There's a part of you that God is trying to animate, bring alive, wake up, that only can be awoken by the disciplines of prayer. Only can be awoken by the disciplines of spiritual practices. Can only be awoken by you spending time in the presence of God. Why? Because this culture, this world, with all of its upside down, wicked tendencies and expressions, greatly shrink and reduce the imagination of God's people. It will make us think that the world, with all of its wickedness, is the final reality. Knowing that in your spirit, God is trying to awaken you to something more. But these verdicts shrink your hope. The illness in your family shrinks your faith. Your own continued failures shrink your potential and possible victories. And you and I will spend less time animating that which God wants to awake and spend more time reflecting, ruminating, and guilt-tripping ourselves about all the failures. 
It's important to know, child of God, that God is trying to keep you and I awake so we don't sleepwalk through the opportunities of God's revealing. Because there is nothing worse than being around God and missing what God is doing. So, you know, I'm kind of person, you know, I'd rather not even have known. <laughs> Amen. I'd ra I, I, I rather not know than know and miss out. Man, I don't know if you ever showed up late to somebody's, you know, cookout. And, and you know, leave you like me, you know, y'all always hear me talk about peach cobbler or things like that. And, and, you know, when I get there and I see a whole pan and it's only juice left. I just, I just start shaking my head. So let's see, see, see what the devil, see, see how the devil be working. I wish I didn't even know about that. I, I wish, I wish all I saw was the pumpkin pie. <laughs> and then I wouldn't feel like I missed out on anything. It's like, well, you know, pumpkin pie. Who cares about pumpkin pie? But when it's something that you like or you know you need and you miss out on it, don't miss out because you asleep. Lots of things that put us to sleep. That man, that woman, that job, those pleasures, those pains, unbelief, anxiety, self-medicating, church medicating. Lots of things that'll put you to sleep. People say, I want to be high in the Holy Ghost. I, 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 I used to say that a lot. You know, we, oof, I want to be high in the Holy Ghost, but how many know the Holy Ghost don't come to make you high? Mm -hmm. How many know when you high, people take things from you and you don't even know they did it? When you high, so I've been told, praise God. <laughs> long, long time ago. <laughs> mm -hmm. People can tell you have truths and you believe it. When you high, you ain't aware of anything that's going around about you. God's not here to make you high. God wants to put you groundly, on, firmly grounded, so you can be sober, vigilant, and clear about what God is doing. I love in the text where it says that the spirit, the glory of God showed up, and they awoke rubbing their eyes. Because there was a lot of things that weren't clear to them until the glory showed up. And could it be, child of God, that you have some, some opportunities to experience the glory of God that can outpace your theological understandings? You have an opportunity to pursue God with such passion that regardless of what's happening around you, you are able to tap into a set of experiences with God. Think about these disciples. They thought they had learned everything they needed to know about Jesus. I walked with Jesus. I've been with Jesus for three years. I mean, you know, Jesus was homeless. I was homeless. Jesus, Jesus was feeding folk. I was eating. Jesus was walking on water. I was in the boat. I mean, I've seen it all. I've learned everything I need to know about this Jesus. And yet Jesus took them to a place that gave them an encounter that outpaced what they knew. I want you to know that God's trying to give some of us some encounters that will outpace your circumstance. And even though you may not be able to fully describe the what and the why, you cannot uh, deny your experience. I've had some experiences with God, and you can quote me a scripture all you want to, but my experience tells me that God is going to work this out. I've had some injustices. I've had some disappointments. I've had some anxieties at work in my life. But my experience has taught me 
that God is not going to let this be the final word. I've had some worries and I've had some people walk out and I've had my body make some funny turns. But God has taught me through my experience that it will be all right. And because I've had these experiences, I can endure more. I can keep pushing more. I can keep outlasting more because I have had an encounter that keeps me awake. When the world tries to put me to sleep. Lord, I wish I could talk to somebody. Give your neighbor a high five and tell them, stay awake. Oh, so, 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 are there things threatening to weigh you down to sleep in your life right now? What are they? We all got them. We got things. I got things. All these disappointments. All these expectations that have not been realized. Oh, they, 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 they like 25 pound barbells on my ankles, on my eyelids. Forget the ankles, I'm trying to stay awake. They're on my eyelids, and I'm just like, Lord, how can I keep my eyes open when I am being weighed down with sleep? God's saying, Come on, I can give you an experience that'll give your eyelashes a workout that'll cast them barbells off. I believe there's more to you and I than what we see. I, I love how in the theological kind of conversation about who Jesus is, it says Jesus is both human and divine at the same time. Come on up here, Erna and, and, and Tanisha. Let me, let me, you know, st stand back to back, like, like, like back to back, back to back, back to back. I want you, I want you to imagine, come on a little way this way. Thank God, thank God. I want you to imagine that this is the life the human and the divine within Jesus' body, coexisting all at the same time. There is a similar struggle happening within each one of us. We got the human side of us that is always proudly standing up. We got the spirit side that is always attempting to be filled. On the mountain, you see that the scripture says that the, 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 the glory of God began to shine bright. Can you just start kneeling down a little bit, Ernie? There you go. Don't hurt yourself. Amen. <laughs> when, when, when the human side of Jesus began to diminish, the spirit began to shine through. In a way that showed, okay, you can get back up. I see your legs getting full. <laughs> Give God a hand praise for these wonderful, wonderful, wonderful people. The spirit of God shined through so brightly as soon as the human side of God diminished. What must you diminish? For God to shine through you today. God, I want to be a better husband, better father, better sister, better grandmother, better auntie, better partner, better this, all these different things, but you don't want any part of you to diminish. Something's got to give for God to shine bright. I say it often, our confession should lead to conviction and produce transformation. Too many of us have a lots of confessions with no convictions, and so we don't get transformed. That's what happens to the church. Too, too many of us, we're so familiar with God, we just hear uh, as a ritual, and we, we have not learned to love people. We have not learned to be faithful to our word. We've not learned to forgive folk because our confession is not backed by the conviction that leads to transformation. Jesus declared who he was, and then he demonstrated it. Final thing I'll say before we get ready to take communion. What will you do with what God has shown? In the text, Peter you know, and Peter, Peter is one of these, 
you know, P Peter is one of these guys who was always out in front taking the big leaps. Peter, when Jesus was walking on water, guess who was the first one out there? Peter. When Jesus was asking, who do you say that I am? Peter, the first one to say, you are the Christ. Here in the text, Jesus is, 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 is taking him into the cloud, and he's like, yeah, let's build an altar. Let's build a memorial. Peter always trying to take the first step, even though he's messing up all the time. God rewarded Peter's risky faith. And I want you to believe God rewards your risky faith. You, Dr. King said, faith is taking the first step without seeing the staircase. You may have to put your foot out there and trust that God will catch you before you really believe God will. That's what faith is. I have all my plans, you know, and then I, I, I always leave a lot of room for God's plan. So God, if you don't do nothing, I know what I'm gonna do. But God, if you if you gonna if I'm gonna take a risk, <laughs> somebody say, man, y'all know you got them plans. How many got your plans and God's plans? How many don't even refer to God's plans like this? Is my plan, God. I hope you bless it. <laughs> I hope you bless it, God. It's, I, I hope I hope you do something with this plan because this, this is all I know what to do. Peter is a great model for you and I to take a risk. Follow God with risky faith. Remember, God is the creator of the universe. God holds our lives in his hand. God's worth you taking a risk. Peter says, let's build a memorial. One of the other ones, Say they, they just were deeply aware of God. They left off the mountain speechless. An encounter with God will force you to do something. Don't just do nothing. When God shows up, make some decisions. God, I am going to allow the confession turn into conviction so I can experience transformation in my mind, in my heart, in my soul, in my spirit. Because it is in the process of that transformation that I believe God will show you what you must need, learn, and know for this season. Don't miss out on what God's trying to teach you. You may not be able to learn this lesson on a mountaintop, on a valley, in isolation or with people. God can show you whatever God needs you to know and see if you are open. In this room right now, there are all kind of signals, radio waves, TV waves, floating through this room right now. You don't see it because you don't have an antenna. Y'all remember what antennas are, right? The antenna is constructed to pull that signal, that unique signal, out of the air and put it in a place for you to see it. Right now, there's all, there, there's, are they playing basketball today? Somebody is on TV. Basketball, NASCAR, self-help, movies, all kind of stuff just flowing through the air right now. Right now, just in here, filling the room. But you don't have an antenna to capture that signal. That's what God's revelation is like in your life. Waiting for you to pick up the right signal. What must we do then? to ensure that our antennas are up during the season of Lent. We do consecrations here at The Way. You know, I try to lay all the Pentecostal holiness practices on y'all, whether y'all Pentecostal or not. Somebody say amen. So some of us be like, Pastor, we just got through a whole month of fasting. I'm going to spend a whole year fasting. <laughs> some of you need to spend the rest of your life fasting. 
Somebody say amen. Yeah. You can't get too much of a good thing up in here now. Pastor, I don't want to do Well, I'm not asking you to fast. What I am asking you for the next six weeks, is there something you can give up that's weighing you down to sleep? Pick it on your own. And in its place, I'm going to get an antenna. Construct one in my heart, in my mind, in my spirit so I can catch what God is trying to show me. Come on, stand with me, everybody. For your glory, I will do anything just to see you, to behold you as my King, yes, for your glory. Come on, grab the hand of someone next to you. I will do anything just to see you, to behold you as my king. I want to be, I want to be where you are. Yeah, God, got to be where you are. I want to be where. Say it again, I want to be where you are. I want to be where you are. This is my prayer. I got to be where you are. Oh, I want to be where you are. Got to be where you are. God, bless the person who I'm touching today. God, you know the parts of them that are at risk of missing what you are doing. Maybe they're in a foreign place. Maybe they're in a familiar place. Maybe they're locked in the valley. Maybe they're trying to experience the mountaintop by themselves. Maybe they're not surrounded by the right kind of people. Or maybe, God, they just have not yet built that antenna and attended to their mind, body, soul, and spirit. Whatever it is, God, in the life of this loved one who I am touching, I pray today that they will not sleep through your glory. May they not sleep through your revelation, your epiphany. As the light comes on, Lord, may it spark a radical change in the way they interact with people and family members and strangers, in the way they respond to this broken world. May they know, God, that there's something on the inside that requires cultivation. So they may, God, be awake when you move, when you show up. Lift those hands right where you're standing. For your glory. Come on, lift them high and say this. I will do. Just to see you, just to see. Come on, lift them up. To behold you as my king. To behold you as One more time. For your glory. For your glory. I will do anything. I will do anything. Just to see you, just to see To behold you as my king. To behold. It is me, O oh Lord, and I'm standing in the need of prayer today. It's my hands are lifted up. It's not my father. It's not my mother. It's not my sister. It's not my brother. It's not my loved one. It's not my friend. It's not my partner. It's not my comrade. But it's me, O oh Lord, and I need you today. And I'm reaching out to you. I'm reaching out, God, because I know you're reaching back down to me. And you are on the edge of your seat waiting to show me what I must know. Show me, God. Beyond the confession of my mouth, move it to a conviction in my heart that translates to a transformation of my being. Hallelujah. Change me, God. Make me brand new. 
and do it for your glory and your pleasure. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.